So I've done this before already. I've done the Joy of Spines this time last week. So I'm feeling full of myself, full of confidence that my tech won't let me down. Um, but that, that, that might happen. Anyway, I've got a phone here that will let me know if anything goes skewy. So welcome, it's five o'clock and welcome to the shape of our collections, which is, it's not, it's a sequel maybe, I don't know, it's, it's not sure how to pitch it. It's, it's not uh, directly linked to uh, the joy of spines, um, but it's trying to pull off something similar uh, by way of presenting sort of um, at scale collections and their everythingness. So um, that's what it's trying to do. I did a quick run through early with a couple of colleagues of this and uh, one of them was a bit worried it, it could be too academic and I thought it, it isn't possible. I'm not bright enough. I'm simply not bright enough to, to, to lose you in this, but I'm going to go slowly. And it's one of those things I've been in presentations before where the first couple of bits are like, that's so obvious. Why are you even saying it? And then the next slide jumps several stages and you get lost. So I'm going to try and make sure that I don't do that um, because it's unfair. It's unfair to people. And you're giving up a lovely evening. The weather in Edinburgh is gorgeous and you could be doing other things and instead you're doing this. So um, a new hashtag, joy of shapes, didn't exist. Unbelievable. Um, so um, if you want to see what the Joy of Spines is about, you can pick up on um, hashtag Joy of Spines. But if you're interested in what's happening over the next 40 minutes, then you could tweet Joy of Shapes instead. Um, and that would be nice. Right. Why? Um, why am I doing this? Well, I, this is, is, is a uh, opening lines of a very famous poem by uh, William Henry Davis. Um, and, uh, you know, what is this life if full of care? We have no time to stand and stare. And uh, I, I don't think we do enough standing and staring. And I love it. I love standing and staring. And in 2009, I stood and stared in Cyprus um, and I watched the sun going down and there it was on the as you look at the screen on the left hand side there is the sun setting and me and my um, uh, now husband we were watching that and loving it and then we turned around and behind us had been rising the moon um, and I know this might sound silly, but it was for the first time that with any profound sense, I'd understood that I was standing on a ball. Um, and whatever else you think you might be doing each day, you get up, you have our busy lives and we do our thing. We are standing on a ball. Now, there are some people, Flat Earth Society, who don't think we're standing on a ball. I'm not one of them. I'm all for spheres. I love them. I'm fully committed to the idea of the Earth being a sphere. And I love spheres. And it made me start to see shapes, um, very simplistic shapes. Um, so Cyprus was a, a turning point for me. I don't know why it took until I was probably mid thirties to really profoundly get a sense that I'm standing on a ball, but it did. Um, this I would love to be able to show you images of, and I can't because they're all in copyright. I'm, I'm a librarian, so I have to set a good example, which is annoying. Um, but the Japanese puffer fish, the male Japanese pufferfish does a thing. So if you Google in your own time, don't do it now because that'd be rude. If you Google in your own time, Japanese pufferfish art, right? And then if you also Google York Minster Rose Window, you will see something quite astonishing. And what's astonishing is the two th creations are identical in their shape. And the strange thing is that, um, the York Minster built in, I don't know, 1100 or whatever, uh, we, we, we know pretty certainly that the, the people who built York Minster didn't go to uh, the Sea of Japan. And we know with absolute certainty that the Japanese pufferfish has never been to York. And yet both designs are the same. And it's astonishing. And the other reason why I'm interested in this shape thing is leaf skeletons. Because if you in autumn if you get a leaf and it's dried out and you look at the leaves the skeleton within it replicates the leaf so it's a fractal of itself um and these things fractal is a posh word uh, uh it just means that, um, that something replicates its own shape if you like so things make shapes okay 
so so far what we've learned in this this zoom presentation is the earth is round and anything with form has a shape well wow you know big wow and you're probably already thinking of leaving this presentation because that's simply um you know it's not news but stay with it because um quick warning here what this is that you're about to go through if you stay is a talk about library science and metadata and it's dolled up as as, as a, a talk about shapes which it is um but it's also about uncovering the way libraries and archives and collecting bodies have to kind of conceptualize their collections um, it is not a masterclass in cataloging yay um so don't worry you don't need to you know take notes or, or do anything like that or pass an exam um it's not a representation of the national library of scotland's policy on cataloging or anything at all it's simply just me having a bit too much time on my hands at the moment and it's not representative of our entire collection so i've i've done some mapping of our collections and there's a there's a bit where i labor this point in glorious technical that's the fun bit um and what I've done is I've tried to match our collections to um, a cosmograph. Um, but it's not all of our collections. So if there's anything missing, don't get upset about it, please. So the shape systems, it's, uh, there are lots of shapes. A banana is banana shaped. Not talking about the myriad number of variations of shapes. I'm interested in the systems of shapes that exist in nature. And when I started to think about this post Cyprus, I, 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 I thought I could only think of four shape systems, dot, branch or fractals, wave or flow and spheres circles. They were the, I, I couldn't really think of any other shape systems. Um, things were those or they were anything. And um, in advance of this, I thought I best check this. So I googled it and I was quite in, I was quite pleased that they are pretty much the shape systems. So yay. Um, there are others, um, but in many respects they are just different formations of those, but blocks, symmetry, um, spirals and Fibonacci, tessellations and variations of, of all of these. So they can all kind of play together in a nice way. So those are your systems but i'm not going to talk about those five i'm just going to stick to the first four um but when we're thinking about shapes has this become too academic folks when we're thinking about shapes and these dots and circles we need to think about zoom and scale as well so you know what what is the what's what's happening here okay so a dot is a single entity but the question is, what is the dot unit? So is a single, when you look at the night sky and there's a dot and it's Venus, you say it's Venus, but, but that dot actually is made up of lots of, um, of atomic things. Um, so planet Earth looks like a dot. There's your, Earth is a dot unit, but of course it's made up of lots of things. So what is, what is the unit that we're measuring when we say a dot? Um, so a book, can you see what I'm doing now, right? I'm, 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 I'm taking the shapes and I'm applying them now, just so it's not, um, uh, you know, uh, confusing. I'm applying them now to bookish things. Is the dot a book or is it an article or a chapter in the book? Is it an author? Is it a poem? Is it a word? So to what degree do we disaggregate things? And of course you can have more than one dot can't you there's lots of dots um literally as many dots as you like um and they they can exist in chaos there's there's not necessarily any relationship to these dots or there is a relationship one-to-one -one or, or or an entire kind of system of relationships of dots um and uh, that's like i suppose in the back of a book you might have a, a bibliography and it's got other things but that doesn't feel so much like chaos that feels semi-structured it's deliberate why those books are being mentioned in that book but all the same things single things can be related to other things and here this looks like a constellation branches and fractals hmm, 
right so get get ready because it starts to pick up the pace actual trees are are actual who knew actual trees have branches i mean that is what we're talking about. trees have branches and of course the tree skeletons in the leaves the leaf skeletons and they have roots the trees that replicate underneath the branch thing in their root system lungs are branch systems nervous systems are branch systems lines of transmission of virus are branch systems and of course we all know about these now in a way perhaps we haven't thought about them before railways roads those kind of networks are branch systems the moment you leave your door your house in the morning you make a decision which way are you going to go and then depending on that you make other decisions now this is interesting for libraries because this is pretty much what dewey um, the dewey decimal system or any system of classification is like this and of course you don't just have one tree you have a forest of trees so you could say well um you've got art and you've got science you've got social science and and they all do their thing um and another thing that's that's like this is is what we call wemmy <laughs> so it has got a wee bit academic now uh, wemmy is work expression manifestation and item so work would be harry potter and the philosopher's stone the expressions of that are the various different uh, english language french language versions uh, so let's say the English language version is an expression. The manifestations of that expression are um, uh, audio book, uh, limited edition, first edition, those kind of things, different editions. And then the item would be, um, this is my particular copy of that, that I've signed or whatever. So that is a branching system, just like Dewey. But the problem is, always with the branches whether the branch is actually part of a bigger tree so this is what happens with fractals so in actual fact art science social science are all part of the tree of knowledge um, you could say if you wanted um, but then look uh, the the tree of knowledge and the tree of experience and the tree of emotions are all separate trees unless they are actually all part of the same tree of life. And you can see this problem, therefore, of trying to separate things into branches or whether they are all have a single stem. That's quite difficult for, for anything. It's just difficult. Be super careful with fractals because in your own time, Google a Mandelbrot set or a Sierpinski carpet or a Menga sponge or a cock snowflake. And, and it's like disappearing into some sort of uh, hallucinogenic uh, hellhole. Like, it's like the start of Jamie and his magic torch. Um, it's very psychedelic and it can bring on an optical migraine if you're not careful. So be really careful of, of those. If you're thinking, I can't understand what Graham's saying, I can't, I can't picture this then check that freaky guy out. This is a, um, a Romanesco broccoli. That is, um, that's what we're talking about. Terrifying and absolute, one of the most frightening vegetables you could imagine. Other things which um, work like this, uh, branches, organograms, family trees. So anybody who's using library collections to look at their um, you know, genealogy will understand this business of, of branching. It's fundamental to, well, to everything, to life and to library science. The, another shape system is wave. So here is a wave. Um, and the issue there is whether it's continuous or not. When does a wave begin and end? Um, and profoundly, really, what is the time scale of this wave? Um, time itself would actually do not bad as being described as a wave it's just a continuous thing um, um, and the reason why i'm interested in it and i'm really interested in it is because i think to myself it tells us what's happening 
And if you thought of that wave as, uh, say, climatology, and it's, it's showing peaks and troughs in terms of ice ages and those kind of things, and then people say, well, we're, we're living in the middle of an ice age. And it, yes, but what is that part of? You're talking about the macro and micro scales. So this bit that I've zoomed in on there, that, that, that's what appears to be a little peak is actually, if you zoom in, lots of uh, peaks and troughs. And if you've ever worked with audio files, you'll know that, that you can just keep zooming in um, on, on these waves. They're absolutely fascinating because, because of what they have the potential to tell us about how one point in time relates to another. But the, the difficulty is that there's the noise in the corpus. I think it's just become too academic. So, um, uh, right. So if I was to say, we're going to look at a wave of books and the books are all from the 1980s. What do you do about a book from the 1980s that is about the Roman Empire? Um, in that data set, so what I'm saying is not all books of a year of publication are about the time they're published in. Obviously, you could publish a book about anything. Um, so, you know, we, we don't we, we don't have books from the Neolithic period, but we have books about the Neolithic period. So I think that's that's why it becomes very complicated to understand and read the the, the wave sounds in a collection of things because of this business of the date of publication and whether something is you could even write a book that was forecasting the future come back to this at the end so another thing is that the wave this is why it appeals to me it's only available in some libraries Ta-da! there i am in the middle of a wave because on one side of me are books published um, social science text uh, published in uh, 1978 and the, on the other side social science books published in 1979 and i'm standing in the middle there um i've, I've parted the waves i'm standing in the middle of um the sort of well that, that that pivotal point in history and somewhere in amongst there you've got the um uh, iranian revolution happening the election of margaret thatcher uh chinese um, economic liberalization and the village people getting to number one with ymca and that's all happening in that wave. And how is it reflected in those books? And the final shape system is sphere and circle. I'm going to finish earlier than um, uh, I hoped. That's nice. Um, sphere and circle. So here we have spheres and it's like a ring fence. You, can, you could say, well, it's a bubble. Um, bubbles are spheres. Um, uh, you can group things together within this, like a collection or a subject category. And within any library, you will often find a special collection. And, and it's been put together as a, as a group of things in this cluster. Um, but the good thing is you can kind of, you can overlap these things and cross-reference things if, if you wanted to with the metadata, the cataloging, um, to show that even though a thing is in this collection, it also shares some uh, conditions with this thing in this collection. You could have things within things. And what this particular lens is to is the ability to zoom in and geographic interfaces. So, you know, you could look at a map of uh, uh, Great Britain and then you zoom in on Scotland and you zoom in on Edinburgh and you keep zooming until you get to the, the precise point you want. So they work like that. But this is what we're coming to. This is, this is the, big, the big intellectual leap forwards that I've taken on behalf of the library community because um, these concentric circles, these layers of, of showing meaning, they've, they've existed for a very long time. There's nothing new about what I'm about to say. Cosmographs, Rotulas and Volvels, they're, they're a thing. They've been around for a very long time. And here is uh, something from our library, um, the James Ferguson Astronomical Rotula from about 1752. Um, and it's a fabulous thing. Uh, moving parts, you can, you can sort of use it to calculate date and time and planetary motion. 
um, and something from uh, I think even earlier, um, the Borthwick Girdle book, which is in our manuscripts collections, a similar thing of being able to to look at the and in this case sort of the, the zodiac, the, the the heavens. So these things have existed for a long time, and I thought what we needed, what the world needs right now, is another one, a brand new cosmograph for the National Library of Scotland's collections. So that's what I'm gonna labor the point now with this nice circular thing. Um, so uh, an Earth-centric cosmography as a way of structuring the library's 30 million things. Uh, so I begin, I'll, I'll just give you an overview. It has, of course, the Earth's um, core, then it has the layers of the ocean. Then we look at the things which belong in the, um, the, the surface of the Earth and then all of the layers above. It's about 20 layers, I think, this cosmograph. Um, so I'm going to skip through it because at the centre of, of this new diagram is uh, the inner core. That's what's at the centre of the Earth. It's at the centre of our collections. And I think to myself, the kind of things that you would have in the inner core are publications, books, manuscripts, collection material about faith and belief, about philosophy, I think maths belongs in the inner core because as far as I'm concerned, a lot of it's faith-based. Uh, a negative times a negative is a positive, really. It's, a, you're just, it's an act of faith that you can't prove it. Um, don't email me, but I'm, I, I personally feel it can't be proven. You just have to take it on, on fact. But those other things in maths, which can be proven, feel to me like they are elemental to, to, to things. Um, biology, chemistry, physics, feel like they are, again, elemental. All of our sciencey books and journals about those things feel like they belong in the inner core. Poetry feels to me, it's a, it's a literary form where it's almost elemental again. It's difficult to express it in any other way than the way it was expressed. And dance. Um, dance is, I think, when we're at our most physically naked, um, dad dancing is a lovely thing. I, I can't be bothered with people who slag it. I think it's great when people forget that people are watching and they dance like they would do if they were in the kitchen and it's gorgeous and it's elemental. And for that reason, I would also therefore put our Scottish Ballet Moving Image Archive collections, which we've, uh, we're in a process of um, uh, digitizing and they're fantastic and they belong in the inner core. After that, you've got the outer core. And I think music belongs in the outer core because if we're honest, really, we wear our music uh, tastes on, on, on the outside um, because it's a way of flagging to people all sorts of things about ourselves, our cool status. Um, so let's be honest, it is moving into the outer core. So um, Kerrang, Smash Hits, NME, and all of those publications that we have, um, we've got vast music collections, um, Handel, Berlioz, um, these kind of things, they, they would be in the outer core as far as I'm concerned. Self-help books, things like that, how to win friends and influence people, psychology, the Coombe collection of phrenology, everything to do with, I suppose, the way we uh, relate to other people um, and, and understand those relationships and build them. Books about language and linguistics and must reads. So nothing specifically comes to mind but this whole thing of oh you must have you read you must read all of that kind of um it's showing off is what it is folks um and i'm not into must reads i think people should read what they want to read it's not a competition um don't put yourself under pressure that you must have read anything no you mustn't just just read stuff you like um so the stuff that you must read um that goes in the outer core because it's really about um making sure you can uh talk sensible at dinner parties and I'm rubbish at it. Then we've got the mantle. So that really, as far as I'm concerned, is where, where we put the mucky stuff. Um, smut, racy literature, bodice rippers, Mills and Boone, Alexander Trockey, Fifty Shades of Grey goes there. There's an author called Nat Carter, um, uh, Glasgow-based um, publisher, um, all racy stuff. Lady Chatterley's Lover, Razzle, obelisk press you might not have heard of some of these things but believe me it's all filth jackie collins jilly cooper that kind of stuff belongs in the mantle um, then you have above that the asthenosphere 
um, also very hot. Um, and I think these are, um, uh, it's bubbling here. It's invective works, I think. So Alan Clark and other political diaries um, belong there. Some of those could also belong in the mantle, if we're strictly honest. But I think that kind of thing belongs in that layer. Um, and actually, probably quite a lot of our 10 million sheets of manuscript, because there's a reason a lot of this wasn't published, because it's all, there's letters and there's diaries and there's slagging folk off. Um, so yeah, quite a lot of the manuscripts would go in the Asphena sphere. Then you've got the lithosphere, where you've got the tectonic plate activity happening. Um, and for that reason, I think works of friction belong there. Um, so biographies, um, not autobiographies, that comes later, but biographies, when you're writing about other people, the social sciences, um, anything that's about how different parts of society um, uh, um, impact on other parts of society, political parties and campaign literature. So every, every general election, the library collects all of this stuff. We've got extremely rich manuscript collections of political um, uh, figures and what have you. So all of that stuff. Um, at the Scottish referendum collection, we, we built a very strong collection in 2014 of, of that kind of stuff. That's all, as far as I'm concerned, works of friction. And then you've got this layer, the Hadalpelagic zone, Hades, the Sea Hades, basically. And that is where your Marianas Trench is and the very absolute pits of the sea um, is down there. And therefore, that's where our hidden collections are. Now, um, you know, most libraries, if they're honest, we all have hidden collections and we'd rather not talk about them. But the National Library of Scotland has been very honest. Um, we have got some hidden collections, quite a lot, and we have a mission to surface them. Can you see what I'm doing here, folks? We must bring these to the surface so people can find them. Um, there's loads of reasons why libraries have hidden collections. You know, you can sometimes receive lots of material at a time when you don't have the resources to catalogue it. And then before you know it, 20 years have passed and it's still there. So we're not happy with that. And we're going to surface the hidden collections from the Hadalpelagic zone. Above that is the Abyssopelagic zone. Um, still very deep, still very far down. And that's where the scary stuff is. When you watch these things, um, uh, wildlife shows, and they've got those fluorescent flashing um, jellyfish, that's where we are. So the scary stuff belongs there. So apps, non-linear narratives, and this, this is a, a visual editions. I've got a, they've got a, an imprint called Editions at Play. They're a publisher and they do amazing stuff, but it's really tricky. It's quite scary. All This Rotting by Alan Trotter and A Universe Explodes by Tio Glow are really good examples of what is happening in the emerging formats world um, where people are using digital technology to create new types of reading. And it's scary because uh, we haven't fathomed how to ingest it. It's very difficult. It's easy to take a book that's in print and put it on the shelf and look after it. It's more difficult to take a permanent copy of something that is designed to change um, on reading. So there, uh, along with the other legal deposit libraries in the UK and Ireland, we're looking at this. We're not ignoring it, but it's scary and it's challenging. Then we have the Bathypelagic Zone. <laughs> we have the Bathypelagic Zone. I will make it. It won't run over 45 minutes. Um, the Bathypelagic Zone is where, um, to be honest, it's most of the ocean. It's what you tend to think of as a very deep, massive amount of sea. So ocean maps, which we have, um, the library's got two million maps and some of them are ocean maps. They go there. The hunt for the Red October goes there because there's loads of submarines in the Bathypelagic Zone. Moby Dick goes in the ba Bathypelagic Zone and the <coughs> manifestations of all of that Wemmy stuff goes in the Bathypelagic Zone. And then we hit a rock because the snail and the whale is a lovely children's book, but the whale belongs in the sea and the snail doesn't belong in the sea. So now you've, you've, you've 
you've got the same problem that librarians have. Where do you put the snail and the whale? You can't put the whale on the land. You can't put the snail in the sea. So Scotland sounds, um, I think, you know, you've got that whole sonic experience in the bathypelagic zone where you've got whales tweeting each other or whatever they do, bleeping. Anyway, the, the whale noises. Um, that's not what Scotland sounds is, it's humans, but it's that idea that sound travels in the bathypelagic zone in a very fascinating way. And uh, we're, we're archiving Scotland sounds um, and it's a, a big project which we're working very hard on. Then getting closer to the surface, but not yet at the surface, we have the mesopelagic zone, which is the deep sea. So it's not like the, the pits of the oceans, but it is, it's still quite deep. The deep sea. So publications about ocean science belong in the deep sea. Um, and I think memoir and autobiography, because it's, it's near to the surface, but it's not at the surface. And it's where I think a lot of things well up um, and it's kind of um, uh, emotional depths feel like they are water based. Um, so I've put, I would put all of the library's collections, uh, memoirs and autobiographies in that zone. And then you get to the epipelagic zone, which is actually the basically the surface of the sea. Um, uh, so the fishing industry, all stuff to do with the fishing industry um, would be in, the sea, in, the, in this zone. Uh, books about herring, other fish are available, but books about herring and therefore Malag, which is um, a, a, a town in um, a, a small town in Scotland, west coast of Scotland, and actually lots of Scotland and its local history. And that is a that is a a niche interest of ours. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear. So quite a lot of Scotland is is coastal, and therefore it's near to the sea, which is the epipelagic zone, and that's where I put that stuff. The Darien scheme, um, that's to do with um, traveling across the sea. So um, the Darien scheme and collections about and resulting from colonialism, let's just be frank. That is um, all about traveling from this island to others and, um, and occupying them. So I'd put that stuff there. Um, the Lyle collection is a collection uh, about shipping and shipbuilding. So I would put that in this zone, angling times, um, would go there. Uh, Jaws, the book, would go there. And sadly, so would our plastic and realia collections. So we do get, we do get uh, content um, uh, that is not paper and uh, plastic features in our collections. Um, we don't put it in the sea, we keep it in our shelves, but sadly, plastic these days seems to find its way into the sea. Bath books, we get bath books. Uh, we don't get many of them, but we do get representative examples of children's books which are made out of um, uh, um, uh, waterproof uh, fabrics that you can drop in the bath. That goes there. Then fortunately we're now out of the sea and onto the land. So the subterranean layer, so under underground, I think any of our collections to do with lost worlds. Now it's difficult. How how do you define a lost world? I think, well, ancient history, Roman history, um, all of the um, archaeological uh, transactions, those publications that we have, we've got lots and lots of this kind of thing. But history generally feels like it is part of a lost world. It's very difficult to know when that lost world has stopped exerting an influence on the current world. Um, but old maps feel like they uh, belong in the, sub, in the subterranean layer. Photographic and moving image collections, they feel to me like they're part of lost worlds because you've captured and frozen a moment in time. But I struggled, I struggled where to put those, but I put them there. Um, caving and potholing, obviously, absolutely, it's a subterranean thing. So all of the magazines and the collections and the books we have about caving and potholing, they would go there. Um, Therefore, the publications of the Save Weems Ancient Cave Society, which we get and um, we're very grateful for, they would go in the subterranean lair, along with Lord of the Rings and Enid Blyton and the Mick McGahey collection, um, who was, um, he was a head of the um, uh, Scottish Union of Miners, National Union of Miners for a period of time. Yikes. I should have checked what his exact job title was. But anyway, Mick McGahey, um, coal mining, and actually, therefore, all of our industrial history and labour history. Um, 
perhaps because it feels now like a lost world or does it or should it but anyway and um, because of the link to the Mick McGarry collection I thought I might put it there and on top of that we then actually have the current built environment the world that we know and enjoy right now so uh, anything to do with currency newspapers magazines football programs knitting patterns architecture books actually the built environment academic journals which are very much about currency and, and and making sure that you're you're publishing things which are relevant immediately and dictionaries encyclopedias these are all things that help us with our daily lives who's who um current maps um yeah so current maps so that is that is what i think is happening now ish but i actually think that probably quite a lot more could be added to that list above that we have the troposphere um, and that's where we have certainly our grey and brown collection. So the troposphere is your mountain range area uh, kind of thing. Um, you'd have the, well, and actually the, 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 most of the sky um, that you can see where the clouds are. So the grey and brown collection of mountaineering would go there and other mountaineering collections, alpine collections. Climate change, any of the journals and the, uh, the publications about climate change would go in the troposphere. Um, anything to do with intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons would go there because that's the height at which they travel. And we've got lots, got lots of stuff about nuclear war um, and therefore dystopian novels. I think they belong in the troposphere because of climate change or because of nuclear war. And actually, therefore, anything published between 1960 and 63, um, 1980 and 84 and this year because they all feel like quite uh, dystopian periods to me because of the threat of nuclear war and other things. But maybe there are other periods of time that we should put in the troposphere, but certainly those belong there. And the more rare book collection of bees, um, no, it's not a collection of bees, it's a collection of books about bees. Um, we, the library doesn't keep bees. And um, that would go there because bees can act, bees can fly up to a height of 25,000 um, kilometers miles anyway they can fly higher than you think bees so they go in the troposphere in the stratosphere which is above the troposphere um, you'd have early cold war publications so before we perfected um, nuclear weapons to wipe us all out we were flying bomber jets and um, uh, you know so the Haynes manual of the Vulcan bomber that would be kind of up there in the stratosphere um, Ian Fleming novels um, they would be up there the Ericsson collection because uh, that's um, the Ericsson collection is about um, uh, uh, the Cold War and um, Soviet relations um, uh, and um, the Edinburgh conversation all of these things which were about kind of trying to dismantle the Cold War um, the Royal Observer Corps magazines, which we received a lovely donation from, from a, a, a member of the public. These kind of things which attach to the Cold War are in the stratosphere. In the mesosphere, there's nothing. There's absolutely, you won't put anything in there because all libraries, and, well, there isn't really much happening in the mesosphere. It's boring. I think they should merge it with one of the other spheres personally, but there's nothing in it in terms of library collections because all libraries need to have um, a place to expand to grow their collections so this is our empty shelving basically and um, then you've got the thermosphere uh, that's where the international space station uh, is um, in that layer in real life so i think therefore anything to do with international cooperation which is what the international space station is a lovely example of i think i think they would go there so international conference proceedings um, they belong in the thermosphere and that's all. Um, beyond that, you have the exosphere and that's one of my favourite layers because that's where, um, that's where the northern lights happen. Um, the aurora borealis, all of that um, uh, collision with the Earth's um, uh, atmosphere and the magnetic field and the solar things. So because of, the, because of the activity of the northern lights in the exosphere, I've put fairy tales there because they feel a wee bit fairy tale -y. The Ossian collection um, would go there. 
the JF Campbell collection there for all of the, I'm, I'm dragging down from the whole idea of, of mystical things. Um, the JF Campbell collection, the Jackson collection, which is about the Faroe Islands, the Thorkelin collection, and um, all of this kind of Scandinavian stuff that the library has. Because I think, you know, Scotland is, is kind of, it's edging towards that neck of the woods. Got quite a lot of stuff about this. Um, all of those recent Scandi lifestyle publications. There were lots of books over the last three Christmases you could buy for people about Scandinavian cultural fabulousness. That goes there. Web archiving, the entire web archive of 10 million archive websites. would The Exosphere is huge, guys. Um, that would go in the Exosphere because it's where communication satellites are. And without communication satellites, there wouldn't be... Um, a web archive and also therefore our e-resources which we fabulously subscribe to and if you're a resident in Scotland so sorry for the international zoom uh, users here um, our e-resources are available for people who are registered readers in Scotland to remotely uh, use from their homes so all of that is enabled by communication satellites in the exosphere and that's why they're there then we have outer space. Now, you can divide these layers. I should have said earlier, uh, you don't write in and complain if I've not put in your favourite layer. There, there are lots of additional layers, but it, I didn't have time. But the, the outer space, really, you could, you could, you know, break it down into further layers, but I haven't done. But in outer space, that certainly would go there. There's a, the, a series of publications we receive from the United Nations. The library is a... Um, a repository for United Nations publications. So the UN Peaceful Uses for Outer Space series, that would go there. Science fiction, obviously, would go in outer space. Um, therefore, our uh, the J.T. McIntosh collection of science fiction content would belong there. The Haynes Manual of the Millennium Falcon would belong in. We've got a lot of these Haynes Manuals. Um, that would belong in, in, in outer space. And the moon, considered as a planet, a world, and a satellite uh, by um, two Scottish um, uh, scientists, academics, um, James Maysmith and James Carpenter, would definitely go in outer space. The clangers um, also, as we know, belong in outer space. I think this is a penultimate layer, is the celestial world and the firmament. And I think that art belongs there. I think all of our books are about art, where you're thinking about the canopy that we paint on and the, the canopy of the stars. It feels to me like a lot of our um, art relates to that realm. Shakespeare feels like it's part of the celestial world and the firmament. I don't know why. Just does. Um, and therefore the Buttes collection in the library, which is, is um, uh, stacked full of extremely important um, uh, treasures to do with Shakespeare. The Glenn collection, a uh, collection of um, uh, musical instrument content and bagpipes and therefore clarion. I feel like I feel like bagpipes could be easily a sort of a, a clarion sound from the celestial world. Um, horoscopes. You know, we're, we're Scotland's largest collection of horoscopes. Don't forget that. Um, so, yeah, they belong in the celestial world and the firmament. And then the final layer is the other world. Um, the bit maybe that we don't even know how to articulate. Um, the Spiritualist magazine is an example of other world. Although I feel like I've got a prejudice here. Um, you know, I've not put other things in the other world. And I've chosen to put that there. Um, but it is about the connection to the unknown, perhaps. So the Spiritualist magazine, which we've just digitised, it's available on, we've digitised um, some of it. Um, anyway, check our website, we've got some, uh, some content there. The Cuthbert collection of gentle magic. We do have hateful magic um, in the collection. And I didn't want to name them because I'm scared, um, but we've got some collections of the the real McCoy but the Cuthbert collection is nice it's about um uh, hanky tricks and all sorts of things it's ever so gentle and it came from a lovely man um Jim Cuthbert um uh, who um just was a, a a joy to work with um AI and bot created content this is other world because we will over time be receiving into our collections 
stuff not written by humans it's already out there there is there are there are bots robots that create content um and there we're at a point where we're receiving publications with no author and that feels very otherworldly to me and untold stories because you know actually um we can only collect things which are committed to paper and there are so many people I know with the most jaw-dropping stories, incredible things, um, life stories and experience, and they've not committed it to um, paper um, or any other recorded format. And those untold stories are part of another world, but they're still special. And even though their silence is therefore in our collection, they still feel like they're part of our collection. Um, so, as the library develops its next strategy, we want to look at um, silences in the collections and people who aren't there and, and maybe hear some of those untold stories. So that is my, um, that's my new cosmograph for the, for the world. Um, there you go. Thank me later. So the conclusion, I've got a conclusion which I need to kind of wrap things up with, is you know, what is therefore the shape of our collections? Is it just a chaos of single entities like books and photos and letters and poems? Is it impossible to break with the idea of a branch system of classification? It's so embedded, Dewey or variants of. Is there some sort of cosmographic alternative? I've just pitched one. Did you like it? Or do our collections exist as a continuum, um, a wave? And I think ultimately they exist both as chaos, um, separate entities, and as structured or structurable things at the same time, uh, which is um, the, 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 the majesty of it really, is, is that it's all of these things. But metadata is key, and so is imagination, and I think it's important, metadata, sorry, um, data about data, the things which help people find things, um, the thing, uh, descriptive descriptions about things, metadata. Um, we need to be more imaginative, perhaps, um, if we're going to get through the 21st century, um, as the amount of content expands exponentially, particularly online, about how we bring it all together and make it useful. And that's what this presentation has been about. You've strayed into a whole thing. Um, waves and Zoom I think should attract our most urgent interest. We've done the branch thing, we've done Dewey, and it, 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 we could keep revising it and changing it, but it's waves and zoom that I think we should be focusing on. So to finish with, the wave considerations, as I mentioned, it's a way of looking at what's happening, but we need to think about whether we sh should pick small corpuses or one giant corpus of all library collections and this is this idea of the Google brain or you know, the, 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 single, the single mind or whatever. Um, it's all a bit freaky and scary, but we should at least address this. Um, noise, scale and the problem of when, that thing I said about a book written in the 1980s that's about the Roman Empire. It's really important that we understand the fine tuning of this. Um, and to give an example of why I think waves are interesting, here's a really blunt instrument, which I accept there's so many caveats around um, is uh, a Google n-gram. So here's a Google n-gram I did today for coronavirus and Spanish influenza um, and this is using a corpus of an awful lot of books from the Google Books project, so in millions, from the 2012 English language corpus. Now it finishes in 2012 but what you'd expect to see is in 2020 a, a tick in Spanish influenza and it would go up, you'd have another peak. But that's not because there's been an outbreak of Spanish influenza, it's because people are referencing it because they're talking about COVID-19. And that, that's about noise and about how do you understand that. Um, but as you can see, coronavirus, and the scale, if you look on this side, the, 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 um, can you hear a hoover? I asked Derek not to hoover whilst I was doing this. Um, on the, uh, what's this, the, on the, the left-hand side, the scale there, you can see fractions of all of these millions of words in the corpus. But all the same, you can see that coronavirus is, is, has been going up. 
Um, if you look at AIDS and HIV as search terms in the English 2012 corpus, you can see that, that they follow a pattern, but there are more usages of AIDS than there are of HIV and then HIV overtakes. Now that's the English, all English language corpus. But if you look at fiction, a smaller corpus within, you see a different pattern. It's broadly the same pattern, but it, there, is, there is a difference to it. And so those are the, um, the, the interesting things about waves. If you had all of our 30 million things just in a one word soup, what would it tell us? And the book that um, some people who are watching this who know my love for the third wave, Alvin Toffler's book, The Third Wave, concludes by talking about how human capacity to crunch data is no longer suitable because there's so much data um, and that he, he kind of talks about the need for artificial intelligence um, and um, what we now have uh, is digital scholarship and the library has a digital scholar um, in, the, in the library who's trying to leverage this kind of meaning or look at ways at least and, and get the conversations going in the library and with um, our users and, and, and partners about data and how we read massive amounts of text um, or you could say well we're not going to do that we'll just have more eyes on this we need reading council reading a council of reading is what's required um, to kind of have as many eyes on as much content as possible but how do you bring it together so whether it's it's ai digital scholarship or a council of reading some transparent global representative mashup is needed if you want to look at perhaps um, this question of what's happening through data that is where i'm going to leave it the shape of our collections its dots its waves its circles and spheres and its branches um, it's really complex and if people are thinking what do librarians do all day um, some of what they're doing is this kind of thing um, and it adds additional meaning to the collections of libraries themselves. Thank you very much.